What is good, streaming people? This is CBS Sports HQ presented by Capital One Spark Cash Plus card. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Great to be with the franchise once again alongside Chris Hassel <laughs> and Tommy you, Tom. Tran. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, it's also been a while since we've had Tennessee be this good, Chris. And on paper, Tennessee and Georgia, the SEC game of the week. Yeah, I went back and looked at the preseason AP poll. Georgia was number three. We Tennessee expected that. was unranked. We did not expect that. Now, Georgia, number three in the playoff poll. Tennessee, number one in the playoff ranking. Tennessee's season has felt like a big budget thriller. The plot? Seeking vengeance after decades of pain. Led by Heisman frontrunner Hendon Hooker, the Vols have used this year to wage vendettas and settle scores. First, payback against Pittsburgh after last season's loss at home. Then, avenging the past five years against Florida and making a statement to open conference play. Their greatest triumph so far, getting the ultimate revenge against a most formidable foe. Taking down Alabama for the first time since 2006, sending Knoxville into a frenzy and their own goalposts into the river. But now the toughest test of all, between the hedges against the defending national champs. The Dogs own five straight wins over the balls and are winners of 10 of the last 12 in the series, presenting yet another opportunity for Tennessee to get even. You can win a game with confidence because you've paid the price, you've worked, you've prepared to go out and play the right way. Both teams, I'm sure, are confident and should be. But George is looking for a Hollywood ending of its own. Kirby Smart's group pulled off quite the job last season, beating their kryptonite when it mattered most. And this year's dogs, vicious, hungry, and well aware they'll need to be all bites in order to handle this vengeful Tennessee team. We have to keep getting better. Like, we're not there. And people want to put us there, but we're not there. The dogs looking to remain on top. The volunteers here to cross another name off their list. The cast is star-studded. The stage is set. The scenes in Athens promise to be pure theater. And we have it live on CBS. Oh, we can't wait for Saturday on CBS. Josh Pate's going to be there. Barrett Salee with us as well. Playoff implications aplenty, gentlemen. I've heard some of our experts suggest that Tennessee could actually be better off losing this game so they don't have to play in the SEC championship game. How do you see it, Josh? I, I want to shake my head, but I don't want to loosen my <laughs> mic. So just picture me shaking my head pretty violently. Um, no. So that's how I think about that. I will say, Christopher, in your beautiful theatric tee-up for this segment, you forgot to say one thing. It's not your fault. You're only limited to what the copy says. I would add, this may be the biggest game in the SEC East this millennium. Uh, that is a very, very loaded statement because the SEC East has not exactly been chock full of these kinds of matchups. But it's so big. And it's so big because Tennessee is back. At the very least, there's another seat that has to be added at the head table of the SEC East. If Tennessee were to win this game, which we're going to dive into, that creates a whole other conversation. But no, absolutely. No one in their right mind in Knoxville is saying, a win against Georgia would be nice, but, but the really, really advanced metrics say, we need to go ahead and drop this one Saturday. Absolutely not. Yeah, Josh, you're 100% right. That would be the equivalent of somebody saying that LSU should not win the SEC championship game in 2019. It's just ludicrous. I mean, tennis, and especially for a program like Tennessee, because Tennessee has not been here in two decades. They have not played in a situation like this really over five or six coaches. That's how long it's been. So, uh, no, I mean, Tennessee wants to win an SEC. Every coach, I mean, every coach that I talk to, every coach that Josh talks to says one thing preseason. I want to win the SEC. Because if you win the SEC, then you're probably going to the playoff. You can't predict the future, right? If you're a coach, if you're a player, if you're one of us, you can't sit here and say, I know exactly what Team X needs to do to get into the college football playoff on August 15th. But that doesn't happen. So every single coach, every single player is pointed at one goal before the season. That is to win the SEC. After that point, you recalibrate. But you recalibrate after that point, not on November 5th. Uh, this is going to be a question that I think we're going to ask next week, so I'm going to get out in front of it. The loser <laughs> of this game, 
not going to go to the SEC championship game, one would think. Do they still, though, Barrett, control their own fate for the college football playoff? Does an 11-1 Tennessee or an 11-1 Georgia get in? I would say about 60-40, they would. I would find it interesting, though, if we have an undefeated TCU, an undefeated Clemson, and a Big Ten champion, Ohio State of Michigan, and an SEC champion, whoever. Uh, I would be fascinated to see in that situation how much the conference championship bullet point matters. Because we've talked about this in the past in the college football playoff era, but really that discussion has not risen to the forefront. It has not gone to the top of the list when they're meeting in Grapevine, Texas before Selection Sunday. If you're talking about a an SEC team, whether it's Tennessee or Georgia, with one loss that doesn't play in Atlanta versus a TCU, a Clemson, both undefeated, I don't know what the answer to that would be. My guess, though, if it's Tennessee, then they have a pretty good chance of getting in. This could get really, really soupy, and you guys know how rarely I use that word on this air, but if we think through this for a second, and I want to kind of go at the Georgia side, there is a growing talking point that will kind of come to a crescendo probably Saturday halftime if Georgia's trailing, where people start to come to the realization that, wait a second, this is not just a big game. This could be a must-win game for Georgia because the conversation that always exists around Clemson could start to exist around Georgia, and that is – even if they run the table the rest of the way, if they don't play for a conference title, is their strength of schedule good enough? That's why that Oregon kind of kind of check mark, that box there that we didn't think a whole lot about when we saw 49 to 3 preseason, that could be a big deal, especially if Oregon goes on to win the Pac-12. But even if they do, guys, if we're looking at, let's say, a Tennessee Bama, I mean, here's where it really gets messy. You got Tennessee winning this thing Saturday. They go on to face Bama and lose a thriller in the rematch in Atlanta. Both of those teams are probably in before Georgia's in. And that hasn't even accounted for potentially an undefeated Clemson or an undefeated Ohio State or Michigan, not even to mention fully what happens in the Big 12, what happens in the Pac-12. So I would, for many reasons, assume this is a must win for both teams. It's part of the beauty of regular season college football we love so much. But if you're going to paint that must win label on anyone's forehead, it's got to be Georgia. Tennessee, there may still be a path here. Plus, they sit at number one forever, that, whatever that's worth right now. But for Georgia, you got to go into this thing with your back against the wall, even though you're undefeated, because you just don't know what your strength of schedule is going to deliver for you, and you don't know how the rest of the dominoes are going to fall. We keep uh, putting that Alabama team alongside Tennessee and Georgia because going into the season, they were the, the favorites to win the national championship. But LSU and Ole Miss fans are saying, hey, we're in it as well, and they are in the SEC West. This game this weekend in Athens is going to decide the SEC East. In your opinion, Josh, is it also going to decide the SEC champion? I'm not there yet. Uh, if they played the game the week after this week, I probably would be there because I have not seen Alabama play what I believe is their best ball. But I do still believe their best ball is sort of in their proverbial quiver. The sense I get around Bama is they have the potential as a team to do some of the same things Clemson has done in the past. Under Dabo, there is no team that has perfected the art of peaking at the right time, more so than that team in Clemson, South Carolina. This team's got the former Heisman Trophy winner. They've got multiple first round draft picks along their defensive front. They have got a plenty good enough offensive line now that they've mixed and matched the right way. Uh, they've got capable receivers. There's just a lot of things. There's a lot of precursors and pretext I'm adding to those because we haven't seen them fulfill their potential yet. I think there is still another level Alabama can take it to. If they do, they still remain my favorite to win in Atlanta. But there's a reason while you look at those odds to win the SEC that they're not the current favorite. And Georgia and Tennessee still have to play each other even. And Bama's still not the favorite. And that is because after you see them struggle at Texas, after you see them struggle again and lose to Tennessee, and you got them going on the road two more times starting this week at LSU and then the next week at Ole Miss, I mean, how long do you say what I'm saying and just think down the road it's going to click for them? That's why this weekend's so big for Bama. I think the winner of this game does win the SEC. And look, I think this is a big test. If Georgia can go out there and beat Tennessee, it's probably going to be uh, playing Tennessee-style football, that uh, up and down the field, basketball on grass, so to speak. And if Tennessee is able to beat Georgia, 
it's because it would have uh, gone up against a defense the likes of which it has not seen before. I think the, the, the winner of this game will complete the picture of what the identity of that team actually is. We know what Alabama is. Alabama is a very undisciplined football team where on the road and neutral sites, they cannot get out of their own way. And for the last year plus, the offensive line has struggled. Go back and look at that Tennessee game. That was Bryce Young playing. Obviously, he had just gotten back from his injury. I don't know how that dude finished that game. He was getting lit up like a Christmas tree. So to me, I think right now, you're going to figure out Saturday who is the complete team, Tennessee or Georgia. We know Alabama isn't. And it's because of things that can't be fixed in the middle of the season. Hendon Hooker is now the Heisman favorite. It's been a, a slow rise each and every week throughout the season. He was a long shot to start it. This week, Barrett, does he have more to gain or more to lose against a Georgia defense that sacked him six times in that Georgia blowout win last season? I would say that he's got more to lose because he is the front runner at this point. Uh, if, if he goes out there and, and lays an egg versus Georgia, the narrative for a lot of people, I'm a Heisman voter. I know a lot of other people who are who don't even work in sports anymore. The, the, uh, it's an archaic method for the Heisman Trophy in terms of voting. So if casual fans go out there or casual media members go out there and see Hendon Hooker struggle against Georgia, he's going to get written off. It's going to be, well, he can't play a real defense. Whereas if he were to go out there and win and look incredible doing it, he's still got to deal with Stroud at Ohio State. And I think that's the biggest problem is that if, if CJ goes out there later in the season and lights up Michigan and leads Ohio State to a Big Ten title, He's going to be in the discussion regardless of what Hendon Hooker does. So I think he's got more to lose because right now there's only one way to go, and that's down because Hendon Hooker is my front runner right now. I'll tell you the thing I'm looking at here. I agree with everything Barrett just said, so let's build off that. It seems in a lot of years you do have that late charge from someone, and we just saw the current odds. So you've got Hendon Hooker, the current odds-on favorite to win the Heisman, You've got the recipe there for a guy like Caleb Williams. If he were to power a Pac-12 championship run year one in the program at USC under Lincoln Riley, that would garner a lot of the, shall I say, ingredients that Barrett's talking about, the shiny ornaments on the tree that impress those voters, and also, less likely but still on the table, Drake May is having a very good year at North Carolina, and they're still in the conference championship picture. What happens if they rise up out of nowhere and he powers them to the ACC title game, and then, uh-oh, they hang 42 on Clemson and they win, and those ballots are due the next day. That would be interesting, but yes, I agree with Barrett. That's the front runner there in Knoxville for a reason. And not only does he have four more to lose, you could have the Bolitnikoff Award on the line with a guy like Jalen Hyatt. you got a bunch of stuff on the line this weekend in Athens, aside from just the final on the scoreboard. Speaking of the line. Love the Drake May love, Josh. <laughs> In uh, incidentally, love the Drake May love. Nobody gives that dude enough attention. Uh, Drake May and still young as well, and a guy who's going to have his opportunities moving forward. The, the line started at 10.5 in favor of the Georgia Bulldogs. It has dropped to 8.5. The total is 65.5. Barrett, where are you going when picking this game right now? I've kind of gone back and forth, but I've settled on Tennessee. Take the points, but you won't need them because they're going to win this game outright. I think Tennessee is living a charmed life right now. I don't think their run defense gets enough credit. That is something that Georgia's offense is founded on. Yes, Stetson Bennett has gotten a lot better this year, and Brock Bowers is an absolute freak, but they have to run the football. They have to work off play action. Tennessee does not give up big plays in the running game, and I think that's ultimately what's going to lead Tennessee to this win because it's going to force empty possessions. And when you just get into plural, if you say empty possessions against Tennessee, you're in trouble. You might be able to afford one, but when you start getting into two or three or four or five empty possessions, then you're in trouble. I think Tennessee makes this a shootout. I don't think Georgia can keep up. We saw last week Stetson Bennett made some pretty questionable uh, inter uh, throws on the, you know, uh, in the game against Florida. The pass that was picked off by, by Bernie was just, it should never have been thrown. So I think Tennessee gets the job done. I think Hendon Hooker outduels Stetson Bennett. I think a lot of people, Barrett and Chris, they were surprised that this line opened where it did. A lot of people expected field goal four or five. To explain this line, you only need to know about pedigree and recruiting. 
pedigree, meaning Georgia's been there. Tennessee hasn't. There's some respect baked into any kind of odds making when it comes to that. And also recruiting. You can't ignore the talent disparity. Now, Tennessee had that same disparity against Alabama. Didn't matter. They beat them. Home field and really one mismatch is what Tennessee leveraged to a win over Alabama. You don't have the home field here. The mismatch is what I'm focused on. Because there could very well be something that Josh Heupel sees in that Georgia defense that we don't see because they haven't been tested yet. And so if you're offering me above a touchdown, I'm taking Tennessee plus the points. I don't know if we're seeing a game played in the 40s here. M maybe a little more along what that total says, low to mid 30s for the winner. But I'm going to take Tennessee plus the points. I think something as simple as what Barrett said, a turnover, which Georgia's been prone to do, could swing this game. I have a little bit too much respect to just pick it outright for Georgia, but I will take Tennessee plus the points. All right, so Tennessee plus eight and a half. The pick from both the guys. Barrett says Tennessee going to win this thing outright. They're seven and one against the spread this season. Georgia four and four against the spread. Fellas, thank you so much. You can hear Josh on the Late Tick podcast three nights a week. Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. It's live on YouTube and Facebook. You can hear Barrett, the Cover 3 podcast, ahead of our college football SEC game of the week on CBS this Saturday afternoon, 3.30 Eastern time. Tennessee, number one in the playoff poll. Georgia, number one in the AP poll. Our great researcher, Justin Page, says it's the first time the number one playoff ranked team faces the number one AP ranked team. The SEC on CBS Game of the Week could end up being the game of the year. Number one, Tennessee travels to Athens to take on number three, Georgia, just days after the first release of the CFP rankings. Kirby Smart will no doubt use their ranking status as a rallying point, but Josh Heupel can do the same since the Vols are eight-point underdogs heading this epic battle between the hedges with Georgia winning five in a row in this series. Time to welcome in Gary Danielson, a lead analyst for us, CBS Sports on the college football side. So, Gary, once both teams made it through the weekend, what continues to be at the forefront of your mind going into this game, 3.30 Eastern on Saturday? Yeah, you know, Ty, I've done a bunch of these, one versus two. I think this is my seventh or eighth one, and they're, they're usually the same. You know, all week there's a great big buildup. There's a hundred different opinions of what could be the key to the game, and you know, in a way, they're all right, and they all could be wrong, and that's what drives these coaches crazy. It Literally, these teams are good because they're just not one-dimensional. So um, everybody has an opinion. Like I said, uh, we'll find out what happens, uh, but we pretty much know that these two teams are battle-tested and they'll show up and ready to compete. When we talk about the coaches, what continues to stand out in terms of Josh Heupel? Because Kirby Smart, of course, has built his program to a championship-level program and for Josh Heupel year one and a half already beating Nick Saban and coming into this one the chance of beating Kirby Smart as well yeah I think you're right they they are looking at this from different sides of uh, the, I guess the spectrum of college football Josh Heupel believes in his system he brought it with him it's everything he knows I mean that's how he played college football that's how he entered the coaching profession learning how to play this spread offense there was a lot of people in the SEC for years and years that turned their nose up at quote unquote Big 12 spread offenses. And Josh has been successful. He's brought a staff that believes in it. He's refined it. And this year he has that perfect blend of uh, offensive um, firepower, much like LSU in 2019, where he's got a veteran quarterback. He's got playmakers at wide receiver. He's got a very underrated offensive line. And when you come into the football game, if you're Kirby and you're Georgia, you know the way you do it works. But this offense will stress you because you pretty much go into it saying, yeah, if we don't get to 35, maybe even 40 points, it might not be enough. So you referenced the Vols offense and with Georgia, one and two respectively in total yards. Both teams averaging at least 41 points per game. And of course, Josh's squad just under 50 per game. When we talk about Kirby Smart and this Georgia offense, they've really come up and come alive this year. And you just had their game, of course. Uh, right. How are they similar? How are they different? Well, that is the beauty of college football. There's so many different ways to do it. There's option running teams, spread teams, or the way Kirby's doing. It's a bit old school with new school players, elite players at positions 
that can take advantage of defense. But, you know, if you'll just look back to a year ago, and I do think that Tennessee's a better team than the year ago, this could be could be the storyline of this game. And a year ago, Georgia rushed for 274 yards in this game, and Tennessee ran for 50-some. Hendon Hooker, who is a major part of this Tennessee offense, only rushed for, I think, 17 times or under 20 yards. So I think if you look at both teams, and I think Georgia is the epitome of it, is they can beat you in a lot of different ways. Tennessee pretty much needs Hendon Hooker to be both a running and a passer. Now, it still works. We saw Joe Burrow do it with those elite receivers. So it's gonna be a challenge. I mean, when Georgia lines up on defense, remember a year ago, they were elite on defense. They sat, I think they had six sacks in this game a year ago, uh, throttling this Tennessee team. But their top seven tacklers, they're all playing in the NFL. This is a different defense for Georgia. Yeah, we've seen them now on Sundays and that historic <laughs> defense last year en route to the national championship game. You referenced their win in Knoxville, 41-17. to was the final, but coming into this one with an injury, Nolan Smith, he's out for the remainder of the season, right. torn pectoral muscle that he suffered in that win over against Florida. So we know that's a big loss, Gary, but how do you anticipate Kirby will backfill that and how different might they look this weekend? It is a big loss. Nolan Smith is our most athletic player. He had a good game in this game a year ago. I think he had an interception, caused a fumble. He's a he's a playmaker, a, you know, future number one draft pick. And, we really had a tough time finding the field last year because of all the talent around him. But when he did, he was elite. I think the bigger part of this, yes, Nolan Smith is a loss, but they get back Jalen Carter. And if you're going to put pressure on this Tennessee offense, you have to do it up the middle. I think that's the formula they used last year when they blitzed those linebackers. Carter up the middle, putting them in. A lot of times they call it a bare front where they crowd the middle of the offensive line and they rush those linebackers in those gaps, I still, that's the only way to do it. Going around the edge takes too long. Hendon Hooker will get rid of it. I think uh, if I had to choose the two, I would, I'd like to have both of them, but I'd rather have in this game Jalen Carter if I could have one of the two between he and Nolan Smith. And Gary, getting back to that offense for Tennessee, Josh Heupel, after the rankings release on Tuesday night, was asked about silent count, how his offense would handle being on the road in a loud environment. What do you anticipate that offense will handle the situation that they have in front of them at Sanford Stadium? It's a big advantage to play at home. Uh, the quarterbacks can change the plays. They can use clap signals. Uh, now it's going to have to be all silent. It's going to be harder to go fast uh, for them. I really think uh, there's no you know, secret why Kirby asked the crowd to be big, involved big time. We saw what had happened to Alabama when they had all those penalties when they played at Tennessee. I mean, this is really the story of this game. Can Tennessee handle this environment against some elite players? They're different players, but they're elite athletes. And if you get off just a split second slower in that offensive line, it makes handling those studs up front uh, really, really tough to do. I think it could be a big storyline in this game. All right, Gary, certainly appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Talking to the coaches on Friday, and of course, we'll catch you, Brad Nessler, and of course, our Jenny Dell on Saturday. Certainly appreciate it, as always. Again, as we get ready for the SEC on CBS, Tennessee and Georgia, those 2-1 monikers, of course, in the AP poll. But we know that Tennessee is number one in the college football playoff. Georgia comes in at number three. You can stream that on Paramount+. Plus. One note that we have before we let you go, since Kirby had joined Georgia in 2016, the only two head coaches to beat both Nick Saban and Kirby Smart in the same season, Gus Malzahn in 2017 with his Auburn Tigers and Ed Orgeron in 2019 with that national title team at LSU. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.